Today on the What's the Deal with YouTube Says podcast, I will be discussing YouTube having animations based on what you're saying in the video, YouTube rolling out an audio limiter for mobile playback, and other stuff too, so go ahead and stick around. But, um, tss, uh. kill me. <laughs> I was going to start with a story that I was titling YouTube becoming the next QVC shopping network. Why? Because that is very, very clickbaity and that would get people's attention. But in reality, the actual story is if you use YouTube shopping, now you can add timestamps. That's it. If you don't know what YouTube shopping is, Creators, some creators have access to this. You are able to link products directly from the YouTube studio. And if somebody clicks on it and makes a purchase, you get an affiliate kickback. That's the entirety of it. The way that it worked up until now, all of the products that you link will show up in a pop-up at the beginning of the video. And I believe in the upper corner, there will be a little shopping bag that allows you to click on it and see all of the products that are discussed in the video. But going forward, now you're able to say at 30 seconds, I discuss product one, four minutes, 32 seconds, product two, 12 minutes, product three. And at those timestamps, now those products would show up. I think this is a really nice upgrade to the program because as it stands, it's a little bit confusing. It's a little bit cluttered. It's not the most useful having all of the products show up at the beginning of the video, especially if you have lower thirds like I do saying, hey, here are the recording settings. Hey, here's the price. Hey, here are the recording settings again. The reason I say that is the shopping pop-up overlays on top of those lower thirds and that stinks. So now I can choose when I want that pop-up to appear. I pulled some analytics and statistics from Podcastage because I have been using this since mid-July, and I just want you to keep your expectations in check. When I first saw this rollout for Taylor Martin from the Best Damn EDC, I think that's who I saw it on, I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to lead to so many affiliate sales. This is going to be so good for me. I have had it for three months. I have 300,000 subscribers. I have received maybe one and a half million views in the last three months. How many clicks would you say I got on these links? I'll let you think for a second. 1,200. <laughs> How many orders did I get? On 300,000 subs, one and a half million views. 11. How much money did I make? 42, no, not 42 bucks, 41 dollars and 82 cents. I don't know if I'm actually able to share that, but whatever. It's not like I'm gonna lose that much money. <laughs> but that is pretty much it. Keep your expectations in check. I think it's a nice upgrade because it will make the shopping program a bit more usable. I did see The Verge saying, oh my gosh, we're going to see a lot more product placement, a lot more product discussions, and a lot more affiliate links on YouTube. I don't think we're going to see any change because this has been around for a while. Maybe more people are gaining access to it. And at that point, yeah, maybe we will. But up until now, if there is any YouTube creator who has wanted to make some kind of product video, they have not had to wait for YouTube to give them access to YouTube shopping. Pretty much every single website, every single service has affiliate marketing programs. So each creator could go out and manually join them, make product videos, and then have affiliate links. The only difference is now the pop-up will be in the actual video. That's the entire story. I'll link the blog. I wasn't planning on discussing that. I, I was going to discuss why I wasn't discussing it. And then I shared my, all of my thoughts on it. Weird how that happens. Now I want to discuss two YouTube updates that I find kind of interesting. Now, when a YouTuber like me asks you to like or subscribe to a video, there will be animations on those buttons. We'll test that in a minute, but this is from the blog post. Link in the description. Can you hear this? 
Why? Why? What are you doing? You done yet? We wanted to bring more life to the video watching experience, so now when you're watching on web or mobile, the page may react to what a creator says. Now, when a creator asks viewers to like or subscribe, a visual cue on those buttons will appear in sync with the video. And once fans smash that button, a subtle explosion of playful sparks will reward them. Top comments automatically rotate so you can scan the best commentary from the community. And for new video uploads, we added a new animation that updates view count and the like count in real time for the first 24 hours to show how many other users are engaging with what they're watching. That is the whole story there. Now when you say certain things, YouTube has the ability to trigger an animation. I don't know if it will improve click-through rate. I don't know if it will improve the call-to-action success rate. But I do think it's kind of neat that they're able to do that. I'm guessing the way they accomplish this is they already auto-generate captions. And when they auto-generate those captions, they have them timed out. So they just probably use that. When it says like this video in the captions, they highlight and trigger the animation to highlight the thumbs up. When somebody says subscribe to this channel, same thing. Okay, when they say that, highlight and trigger the animation to put fireworks off on the subscribe button. So let's try it. Let's give it a shot. Let's see if it's live on this channel. Get ready to smash that like button on this podcast episode because goodness gracious, I've been putting a lot of work into it. I didn't throw away 45 minutes of footage already today. Nope. But because of that, you should like this video. Do it right now. Did it work? How about this? You should smash that subscribe button right below this video, kick, pants, ba-boom, ka -pum. Click that. I hate myself so much right now. <laughs> it is stunning how much I hate everything that I have chosen to be and do today. <laughs> you know what would help? If you hit that subscribe button. <laughs> so please do that. Hit that subscribe button and make me feel less bad about all the decisions I've made. <laughs> Nothing you can do or say can fix this one. I have dug myself this hole. The second update that I want to share from this blog post, again, linked in the description, is YouTube has essentially rolled out an audio limiter. The blog says, easy on the ears. We're giving you better audio control on mobile devices. Rolling out starting today, stable volume will be automatically turned on to reduce jarring differences in volume for an overall improved watching and listening experience. I think this is a great update because I know I'm one of the minority here, but I think, excuse the very inappropriate expression, but I find those ear rape videos to be extremely unfunny. Hey, look, we hurt your ears. Hey, look, we're damaging your hearing. Ha ha. Good joke. So I think this is really nice. I will be interested to see what kind of impact this has on audio quality. It does appear you will have the ability to shut it off as well. But I am glad that for the last two years, I think, I have been uploading audio of my podcastage reviews to podcastage.com. 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 So you can go, <laughs> go there and listen to the audio and not worry about YouTube having to do this. But ultimately, I think it's nice. I am curious why they're only rolling it out for mobile listeners. Maybe this is already enabled on browser players. I don't know. But I'd imagine this would be useful across every single playback system. So we'll see. But very interesting update. Very good updates, in my opinion. And please subscribe to make me feel better about this. <laughs> that is it for the news. Now let's talk about what I've been testing. <laughs> 
I don't know. <laughs> I really, I am really questioning everything that I have been doing today. I am running the Sure SM58 into the Roadcaster Duo. I have had this mixer. Oh, full disclosure, this is a loner from Rode. I mean, I, I'm at a comedy club up on stage. We don't have RCP duos sitting next to us. But the RCP duo that I am testing is on loan from Rode. This has been sitting in the box for three months, I think. And last night in voice chat, somebody asked me a question about it. So I opened the box for the first time and actually pulled the device out. And I saw how teeny tiny it is. I kind of love it. <laughs> I kind of love how tiny and small and compact it is. For me, for an individual podcaster, a solo podcaster who also will run a guitar DI, I don't think I could ask for a better desktop mixer. In terms of functionality, in terms of size, in terms of usability, it's fantastic. As far as the performance, we'll see. In terms of the support, we'll see. But from a day of use, super duper. I did notice the headphone amp did have a bit of hiss. I actually had the headphone amp all the way down and I still heard hiss. I was using the Audio-Technica MTH-50AX things. That's not right, but <laughs> you know what I mean, the 50Xs. And there was a bit of hiss there. Apparently, that is a complaint of the Rodecaster Duo. I haven't heard that about the Rodecaster Pro 2, but there you go. That's what I'm testing. That's what you're listening to. Let's go ahead and uh, on stage, let's see what people think about that. That's some pretty cool support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, now let's jump to what you had to say. First comment comes from Alan, a.k.a. Sound Speeds. And he says, Whenever you're looking for a piece of gear online, unless you need it urgently, consider looking for the average price on Google Shopping. If the product is on Amazon, you can go to websites like camelcamelcamel.com to see the price history of the product on Amazon. That will give you an idea of when products might be going on sale and what kind of deal you can be watching for. Then take this knowledge off Amazon if you want to keep in mind that some products like the Shure SM57, 58, Beta 58A, Sennheiser 416, and others are heavily counterfeited on websites like eBay. So whether buying new or used, low, make sure you aren't lured into buying a counterfeit product. Prices that seem incredibly low are highly likely to be counterfeits, even if buying in sound forums. Bulletproof mics like those retain their value very well even years later, so buyer beware. Also, some manufacturers, like Rode, warn against buying their products on websites other than theirs or those linked off their websites. Again, beware. As for live streaming, you should join me on one. Your audience will get plenty of banter time then. Whoa, a new outro VO. Alan, thank you very much for the comment. That is a great suggestion about Camel, Camel, Camel. I have used that website quite a few times to identify, I think it was the King B, because I wanted to know what that microphone initially went for. That's where I learned it initially went for 350 bucks. When it dropped to 100, Bye, bye, bye. Blue horseshoe loves anacot steel. Don't measure a man by the size of his wallet. That is a great piece of advice. <laughs> I have lost my mind. I'm screaming lines from Wall Street while talking about camelcamelcamel.com. As far as the live stream, I will, of course, join you on a live stream. And then a new outro VO. Yes, kind of. I was just going through my NAS and I came across a folder, BSP outros. I had a bunch of submissions from years ago and I just figured, hey, let's drop one of these in. How fun is that? 
So I'll open this up to anybody who's watching and or listening. If you want to send in an outro, you know what it sounds like. You know the words that are said. Go ahead and do that. Send it in to askbandrew.com. Instructions there. And yeah, you can do that. You, you can be on that. You can. That is also very good advice about the counterfeiting thing because that seems to be a growing issue and not even just with mics that seem to be a deal that's too good to be true. Because Pags brought this up from MEI Studio. He brought this up a couple of weeks ago as well. Even if a microphone isn't too good to be true, some of those on Reverb, some of those on eBay are also counterfeits because those sellers are wising up. They know people are spotting, oh, this is 50% off. It's a counterfeit. So instead, they say, it's not 100 bucks, it's 90 bucks. 10% off doesn't seem unreasonable. So it's almost to the point where you need to buy from somebody you know personally, somebody that you trust really deeply, or just an authorized dealer. Because it's getting too dangerous to buy classic mics because there are so many counterfeits thank you very much alan i appreciate your input why am i breathing so much (sighs) i don't know (laughs) next let's jump to a comment from dr lex they say hi bandrew a question just came to mind are there any noise reduction panels you specifically recommend for treating a room? My new office is somewhat small, and I can notice some reverb when the door is closed to keep the cats out. So I'm looking for ways to reduce that with foam panels on some of the open walls, ceilings, etc. I tend to buy Elgato for most recording products lately as their stuff has been quality with no issues in my experience. However, I think that they know this and inflate their prices as a result. I'm currently having a hard time justifying $100 for their six hexagonal panel package and don't know if something like a $26 pack of 12 eggshell panels would do the job just as well. Thanks, Lex. Lex, thank you very much for the comment and the question. I will start by saying I have not used the Elgato sound treatment, so I cannot speak to how effective it is or how ineffective it is. I have, however, used that super budget egg crate foam from Amazon, 12 for 26 bucks, whatever it is. It's not the most effective. It's going to mainly attenuate the upper frequencies, but... It's fine. It's better than nothing, I guess. What I did is I went with Automute, is what it's called. It's not the greatest. It's not the cheapest. But it's pretty good. You heard it in the bathroom test a couple of weeks ago, if you listen to that. Made a big difference there. That's what I use to cover my windows. I have Automute blankets. I have Automute panels to my left, to my right, to my rear, everywhere. I don't know why I'm pointing in these directions, because I am up on stage in a comedy club. But in my studio, I have it set up like that. So that is really all I can vouch for. Automute, and I wouldn't really vouch for the budget Amazon ones. I know a lot of people like building their own because it's a lot more affordable. Owens Corning 703 is the material they use, and then they build their own. That's probably the best and cheapest route to go. Hopefully that was helpful, Lex. Thanks for the question, and let's jump to the next one, which is from I Don't Know. They say, I would love to see some on-off comparisons for CPF, which is circular polarizing filters, for oily skin, glare, and glasses. Most of the existing material is for outdoor photographers, but not for talking heads. Based on what I've heard, it's not very useful for indoor usage under artificial lights. I.e. somewhat good for blocking LCD screen reflection and glasses, but mostly useless for blocking video lights, e.g. Godox FL100 with diffuser and grid. Also, should one stay still, or is CPF forgiving for slight movement inside the frame? Andre, thank you very much for the comment and the question. I came back indoors from wherever I was recording the actual podcast to make this demo. 
I apologize because if you're watching this video, this may get a bit disturbing. I am going to zoom in closely on my face to the glasses so you can see what a polarizing lens does for me. Now we are zoomed all the way in and the area you want to pay attention to is the glass in the glasses as well as the gold frame. Both of those are being very reflective. To my left, I have a white screen pulled up and that is being reflected in the glasses. And as I rotate the polarizing filter around, you should be able to see that reflection disappear. Right here is the best that I'm able to get. The glare on the golden frame around the glasses disappears and also the majority of the reflection of the white screen is removed from the glasses. So. Although you're saying it doesn't work with artificial lighting, I have found that it helps me tremendously when I have a computer screen and I have glasses that reflect that computer screen. So maybe it doesn't work for some people, but in my experience, these polarizing filters are quite helpful. Yes, you will still get some reflections. It doesn't remove every single reflection. It doesn't reject any kind of light coming off of stuff, but it does reduce the amount of reflections quite a bit in my experience. So there you go. That is my quick demo for you. Hopefully that was helpful. All right, I am back up on the comedy stage. Thank you again for the question, Andre. I very much appreciate you. Lastly, we have a comment from TJ Zuppi. He says, regarding Brian's pops, this is, an, this is an issue I've had with multiple roadcasters and now the duo. This happens on both computer recording and recording to the card. Someone had suggested it was due to the electric wiring in my house. I went out and bought a power conditioner to help with those transient spikes, but those pops still persist, though they only happen once or twice over 20 to 30 minutes, not totally frequent. However, this never occurred when I used the Mixcast 4, which was also plugged into my old house's power in the same way the roadcasters have been. There are times I swear I've heard it on other videos with people using the RCP2 or Duo, but at this point, it may just be a, you buy a certain car and now you notice everyone driving them phenomena. But it is over multiple roadcasters for me, so I've just learned to live with them and try to eliminate them in post. It's maddening. TJ, thank you very much for the comment and thank you for sharing your experience and your issues with the Roadcaster Pro 2 and the Roadcaster Duo. That is one of the biggest issues that I have with reviews and trying to help people troubleshoot. If I'm unable to recreate the issue, I have no way of knowing how to resolve it. And if I don't encounter that issue, I'm not able to critique it for that. That is why I appreciate so much when people like you, TJ, share your experience over using these products for six months, a year, two years. You have a much deeper and more intimate understanding of these devices, of the pros, of the cons, compared to somebody like me who uses it for a month, two months, and then reviews it. So I really do appreciate it, and I hope there is some kind of resolution. You said that people were suggesting it's the old wiring in your house. I don't know if that was Rode telling you that. I would try contacting Rode. Maybe they have some kind of workaround. I have no idea. Because I imagine with how many of these things they've sold, they've likely encountered something similar to that. So maybe they have some kind of trick. You got to stand on your head while recording. Got to stare at a brick wall while recording. You need to, oh, you need to stand in a corner, a creepy corner while you wait for a witch get it and that'll avoid the pot i don't know but given the price that you're paying for the roadcaster pro series 500 or 700 i think that's kind of unacceptable that you're just having to deal with it come to terms with it that's unacceptable you shouldn't have that kind of noise in your recordings when you're paying 500 to 700 dollars for an interface portable recorder mixer unacceptable but I appreciate you so much, TJ. I hope Road comes up with some kind of solution for you because you deserve clean recordings without pops and cricks and crackles 
and heckles and hackles and backles and booples and beeples. I don't know what that was. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Too bad my RCP duo does not have booze because I was trying to boo myself. But now let us jump to the value for value segment. Number one, 20 euros from TechMed Rainer Richter Danka. Rainer, thank you so much for the 20 euros. Thank you for the support of this podcast. And I know you left a lot of comments last week and you said you were going to stop posting so many. Do not stop posting so many. I love hearing from you. I love having a lively comment section where people share their thoughts throughout an episode. Do not view that as a negative. I loved reading through them. So keep it up and thank you so much. Next, we have five USD from Sad Luigi 98. He says, Will you ever do a Lewitt LCT 840 review? I know you did a podcast to comparison, but never a full review. I think it sounds amazing and seems maybe similar sounding to the U87, but not as pricey. But there isn't many videos on the microphone. I'm thinking of getting rid of my TLM-103 for it because of the more clean mid-forward sound that I'm looking for, for singing, but don't see many online samples of it. Thanks for reading. I know that was long. Lol. That's embarrassing. (laughs) What was the question? I forgot. I'm too embarrassed. I do eventually plan on reviewing the LCT-840. I just have not gotten around to it. I've been using it on and off for, my God, three years at this point because I bought that in 2020. So it's come in time where I heck and need to get off the pot or not. I need to review that thing because if I wait long enough, it's going to get discontinued like the $600 Lewitt USB microphone that I bought that was that wasn't due to me waiting so long. I bought it and then a few months later it was discontinued. The DGT650, I think it was called. I will eventually be doing an LCT840 review. Maybe I should do that soon because I have two videos. I know what Tuesday is going to be. I know what the following Tuesday is going to be. I want to do the RCP duo. I have a ribbon microphone that I want to do from Rode, which I bought with my money, although I need to spread that out from the Duo. Then I'll do the Lewitt. It's always difficult determining when you're going to review each microphone or each piece of gear because I know that Lewitt stuff doesn't do terribly well with the YouTube algorithm. It's not this widely known brand. And it kind of stinks knowing that you're putting 20, 40 hours into a video that just isn't going to perform the same. But as an audio gear reviewer, that shouldn't matter. It's kind of my job to review stuff regardless of whether it's going to perform or not. But at the same time, I guess we could actually use views to determine how useful a video has been. More views means you're helping more people. Fewer views means you're helping fewer people. But as a reviewer, As an audio gear, I'm not going to call myself a journalist, an audio gear enthusiast, saved it. I should be exposing myself to as many pro... That sounds dirty. I should be... (laughs) I should be experiencing as many different products as I can and sharing as wide a... Oh, as wide amount of coverage as I can because... That in and of itself is helping people. It may not get individually an amazing amount of views, but people being able to hear Lewitt LCT 840, Telefunken TF 47, Pure Tube, Rode K2, hearing all of those gives them a better understanding of the tube microphone market. So, long answer short. Yes, I will be reviewing it eventually, and I should get around to it. Thank you for the motivation. I very much appreciate it, and I appreciate the support. Finally, we have 25 euro from Nico. He says, Hi, Bandrew. It's Nico from France. Thanks. You're also my favorite man from the United States. You helped me a lot to find the right gear for me, so thank you very much. And every Sunday, we're happy to see you. You've become a friend for the audio people. See you, Bandrew. 
Nico, thank you so much for the super thanks. And more importantly, thank you so much for those incredibly kind words. I am honored that I am your favorite man from the United States. Eat that, every other United States audio YouTuber. Neener, neener, neener. I win. I win. Okay, this is me being very ungracious and unkind and rude. I very much appreciate it. And there are other tremendous YouTubers. I can't help it. I'm just get. I'm happy. I am Nico's favorite <laughs> United States person. Every other United States man sucks. <laughs> this is not becoming. This is not becoming. Oh, my gosh. I really do wish I had a boo button on my mixer right now because I deserve it. Joking aside, I really do appreciate the kind words, and I love making these podcasts and getting to interact with you, getting to hear your thoughts on stuff. It is just such a joy for me. Making these episodes can be a nightmare. It can make me bang my head against the wall. But once I start going, once I get on a roll, it becomes so easy and so much fun. I spent an hour trying to record before I started this recording. I was ready to stop recording. I was ready to walk away for the day. But I said, no, I am going to switch up microphones. I am going to handhold the microphone. I am going to move things around. I am going to get on a comedy stage and I am going to make it work. And as soon as I got the ball rolling, as soon as I found my groove for the day, it was an absolute joy. So I am honored that you watch, that you come along, that you put up with my shenanigans, <laughs> my nonsensical ramblings, and I love each and every one of you. So again, thank you very much to Nico, Sad Luigi, and TechMed Rainer Richter for supporting this podcast in the value for value way. Much obliged. You are incredible, and you make the production of this show possible. You allow me to keep my bills in an airtight container in a refrigerator to avoid freezer burn. Like I said, thank you for putting up with my shenanigans. <laughs> Please like and subscribe. That is it for this week's episode. I was off my game to start, so I am. What time is it? It is now 2.45 p.m. I'm skipping Ask Bandrew today so that I'm able to get this show out today. I appreciate you so much. I hope you have an amazing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will talk at you, with you, about you, about whatever you want me to talk about, but really what I feel like talking about, and I will talk to you later. Thank you so much. I love you. Bye-bye. Whoa. Whoa. Boop. has been a Geeks Rising production. For more information, check out geeksrising.com. Pizza!